Welcome to Long Covid Doctor, an educational series for sufferers of Long Covid. I'm Dr Tim Robinson, formerly a GP for 30 years, now GP lead for three separate NHS Long Covid clinics, and also a NHS England clinical lead in Long Covid across the southwest of England. This episode is on gut problems, gastrointestinal problems and long COVID. In part one, I talk about the symptoms, diagnosis, investigations and causes. In part two, I will talk about the treatments, management and outcomes. References, links and resources are in the show notes below. Any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own GP or qualified health professional. So here we go. Gut problems, gastrointestinal problems and long COVID. So firstly, the context, the background. Gut problems are extremely common in long COVID. Gut problems particularly affecting the lower bowel, in my experience in the three long COVID clinics I work in, are extremely common and they have a great impact on our patients. This may be the worsening of previous gut problems that the patients have or a completely new problem that they've never had before for the, for no reason whatsoever other than the fact that they have had and still have long COVID. And so what are our patients experiencing and what are the symptoms and associated symptoms? Well, perhaps the commonest symptom is a change in bowel habit, loose motions, diarrhea, semi-formed or watery, frequent bowel actions, an increase of up to sorry, four, five, maybe even 10 times per day, I have heard. Uh, in patients who previously have really only had a normal bowel function open once a day, say, uh, but now they're afraid to go out because of those increased bowel frequency, so they become a bit housebound. Uh, they then have to wear padding to prevent accidents, or perhaps they've had accidents. Maybe the bowel function has become variable, alternating between loose and constipation, variable bowel habit. There may be associated colicky pains, gurgling, more berygmai we call it, excessive wind, maybe blood or mucus, maybe weight loss, may be they've had a, become a sort of slightly de- intolerant or sensitive to specific foods, cannot eat wheat or dairy or some other individual specific food. They may be associated upper gut problems such as indigestion or reflux, so heartburn or swallowing problems. They may have uh, developed, um, as I say, uh, a worsening of their um, pre-existing underlying gut problems such as uh, irritable bowel syndrome that has become worse. Uh, Inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis that now may well have become worse. And so those are the common symptoms that our patients are telling us. What are we going to do about it? How do we go about helping? We need first and foremost, to make a full medical assessment to get a diagnosis. So what do we need to do in order to achieve this? We need to take a standard history and examination to get that diagnosis. Specifically, we are looking for possible differential diagnoses, other diagnoses in which those gut symptoms are present. And how do we go about this? We need to take a thorough history and examination. Firstly, the standard detailed history, everything about those symptoms. What exactly is the patient experiencing and how often and how long the patient has has the patient been having these problems. 
uh, what are the worsening and relieving factors? What is their impact on the activities, the patient's activities of every lay living? Are there any associated symptoms? What's the past medical history? Does the patient have pre-existing irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease? Medications, are they on any medication regularly or have they tried medications for their symptoms? And if so, what were they and how effective were they? Then on to the examination, uh, appropriate to the symptoms and history discovered uh, and focused obviously mostly on the abdominal system. The reason why we have to be so thorough is to look out for red flags, so-called, i.e. symptoms and signs that suggest something more sinister. So, what are those red flags? Well, a change in bowel habit is definitely a red flag. Blood in the motions, obviously a red flag. Unexplained weight loss, likewise. Mucus in the stool could be due to an adenoma, a, a, a polyp, a growth in the large bowel. All of these need a referral to hospital. Basically, we don't want to miss something much more serious, much more sinister, such as a bowel cancer, for example. Bowel cancers present with a change in bowel habit, blood in the motions, and more often than not, a change in the weight, or weight loss. Even if there are no obvious red flags, but your instinct tells you that something just isn't right, just ask. If in doubt, ask. Go to your GP. This is important. Having taken the history and examination, it's on to investigations. So, firstly, we always do blood tests, don't we? We'd like to do a full blood count to look for iron deficiency anemia. We'd like to do a vitamin B12 and folate if we suspect that there may be malabsorption. We'd like to do a kidney and liver profile. Likewise, we'd like to do a CRP and ferritin looking for inflammatory markers. We'd like to do a thorough function test, um, knowing that uh, an, ex an increased thyroid uh, activity, hyperthyroidism, can present with diarrhea. And finally, an HbA1c looking for diabetes. Another blood test in this gastrointestinal context uh, that is certainly worth, worth sending off is a celiac antibody, a TT. G antibody, which stands for tissue transglutaminase antibody, and an IgA, just to make sure that we uh, that the patient hasn't got celiac disease, new onset. Other tests that we do frequently in general practice is a FIT test, the fecal immunochemical test, looking for blood in the stool, a very sensitive test blood in the stool, also a fecal calprotectin test to look for inflammation in the intestine. Another test that we uh, frequently request in general practice is an ultrasound scan of the abdomen, so looking at the abdominal, the abdominal uh, organs, such as the liver. And so, having excluded the differential diagnoses and the red flags, we are left with the diagnosis of gut problems due to long COVID. And this is a good point to be at because we have not been COVID blind. And what do I mean by this? Just because you have had COVID and now have long COVID, it doesn't mean that a new problem, a new symptom, can be put down to that. It might be due to one of those other causes that I've mentioned, such as bowel cancer, for example. And COVID just happens to have occurred at the same time. So, like I said, we mustn't be COVID blind. 
we've got to go through the normal stepwise process to eliminate any sinister pathologies. Having done all that, as I've said, it's now into the gut problems due to long COVID. And question, what are the causes for those gut problems that that patients are experiencing? What are the long COVID causes? It's important to know those causes because it helps us understand the problem. And hence, it helps us accept the problem. And it also reminds us of the unknowns and complexities of long COVID, all the things that can go wrong in long COVID. And hence, the reason why fixing it is never going to be possible by doing just one thing. And so, as we know, there are many causes for long COVID. That brings about the gut problems. The list is long. There's damaged tissues, there's overactive inflammatory system, there's dysfunctional immune system, there's damaged autoimmune system, there's disrupted bowel uh, friendly bacteria, what we know as dysbiosis. Those friendly bacteria have been disrupted. So in a little bit more detail, um, I'll just go through the causes. Like I said, I think it's important to really have a good handle on uh, on those causes and knowledge to help the understanding and hence acceptance. So like I said, the, the list is long. So let's quickly skip through them um, and one by one, just to sort of familiarise yourself or re-familiarise yourself probably. So first of all, there's that, the the effect of COVID on the gut itself, the direct gut tissue damage from the initial infection. The gut is lined by ACE2 receptors. As we know, the ACE2 receptors is where the spike protein on the surface of the of the COVID virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, link on, link into the cells in and around the body. And most cells in the body, as far as I can see, have ACE2 receptors. Gut is no exception. Gut has loads of ACE2 receptors in its, then the cells lining the gut, lumen in the member, mucous membrane. And this causes cell damage of those, those, those cells lining the gut, which leads to inflammation, can lead to cell death. And then that leads to leakage between the cells, uh, what's known as the tight junctions, become leaky. And that allows toxins and inflammatory factors to get into the bloodstream. Then there's dysregulated inflammatory response, that's generally as well as locally in the gut wall, resulting in, you've heard it before, the cytokine storm. And also, this is important, mast cell, mast cell activation. There's, there is a highly high density of mast cells lining the gut, gut wall, more on that later. And then another part of the over excessive inflammatory response is microclot formation, microthrombi in the blood vessels serving the gut wall, leading to yet more inflammation in the gut wall. And then there's dysfunction of the immune system producing autoantibodies. That's basically autoantibodies, antibodies directed to our own cells our own normal cells lining the gut and in the blood vessels lining the gut and also um, celiac antibodies. So again, this is a sort of an autoimmune condition. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, we're seeing these new onset, new diagnosis of celiac disease in our long COVID patients presenting with patients presenting with new wheat or or gluten intolerance. We're seeing patients with newly diagnosed celiac. I'll say it again. Then there's dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. Well, if there's 
an effect on the sympathetic parasympathetic balance for normal gut functions and those are sort of enzyme release um, in the intestinal juices as well as the motility uh, sort of if you like the construct the the constrictive peristaltic waves that pushes push food through our intestines that can all get disturbed if the autonomic nervous system is disturbed and we know that the autonomic nervous system is more often than not disturbed in long covid and then another cause is as i mentioned this earlier the disturbance of the of the gut microbiota the gut flora your friendly bacteria are replaced by unfriendly bacteria that cause inflammation in the bowel lumen in the cavity of the bowel a healthy gut flora is generally important for well-being and the immune system and also for production of hormones and chemicals neurotransmitters um, such as serotonin dopamine gaba um, these are all produced in the gut lining and uh, and with disruption of the microbiota therefore their production those production of those neurotransmitter chemicals will be impaired vitamin b12 is absorbed uh, in the large the, the beginning of the large intestine and uh, at the end of the small intestine and so you know, if you've got problems with the microbiota that's going to cause uh, that's going to interfere with the absorption of b12 and likewise k vitamin k production uh, occurs in the bowel part of the blood clotting pathway vitamin k uh, that will be disrupted and then another fallout disruptive um, fallout consequence of a disrupted um, microbiota is the butyric acid production is reduced uh, butyric acid is an energy source derived from short chain fatty acids which were broken down in the large bowel um, and then finally with a disrupted um, microbiota that has an ill effect on the gut brain axis this interplay interconnection between the brain and the gut and finally besides all those other problems the excessive inflammation the autoimmune the direct effect the effect on the microbiota there is also an effect on mental health understandably resulting in stress, tension, worries, low mood, leading to a tendency for overactive bowel. So, um, basically the situation is worsened by persistence of COVID virus in the gut and parts of the RNA um, nucleotides, the sort of, you know, the building blocks of their genetic material. Studies have shown virus in the um, stool sample up to four months following um, a COVID infection in patients who have actually recovered from from their COVID in illness. Of all those underlying causes, one of them needs special attention, and that is mast cell activation (MCAS), otherwise known as. This is one of the consequences of the initial COVID infection, and part of the general overactive inflammatory response. We deal, I deal with this more um, in my talk on MCAS, but very briefly, mast cells are in high concentration um, lining the gut um, as part of the first line defence against infection, invasion from the outside world, part of the in innate immune system. They contain, mast cells contain histamine and other pro-inflammatory factors so when they're triggered they release all the all these inflammatory factors into the gut which contributes to the gut symptoms as well as the general inflammatory response and so if the mast cells are activated and then release all the chemicals 
there will be the onset of the long COVID symptoms, such as gut symptoms, lower gut symptoms particularly, diarrhea, colicky cramps, distension, as well as upper gut problems, nausea, reflux. I mentioned this earlier, throats, throat tightness, swallowing problems, as well as, again, I mentioned this earlier, food intolerance and sensitivities that the patient has never had before. And so MCAS is an important contributing factor to long COVID gut problems, as well as all the other problems it itself brings. Um, Like I said, um, I cover this in my talk on mast cell activation. So there it is. That is uh, the long list of all the possible causes of long COVID gut problems. It's very complicated. And one patient may have just one of those processes going on, or they may have one or two or three or all of those processes going on, bringing about their long COVID symptoms and more specifically their long COVID gut problems. It's little wonder that long COVID causes so many symptoms with so many underlying causes across so many systems throughout the body. It's complex. As I keep saying, it's the perfect storm. So that's what's happening. Uh, That's what uh, has caused those long COVID gut problems. Like I said, it's important to know those causes, to be familiar with them, to understand them. Uh, Because I, I believe, I truly believe that it helps us understand and hence accept the problem, accept long COVID. But what's more, what is is more important is what are we going to do about all these symptoms and the patient who has these gut problems? So I'll come on to this, um, uh, the treatment, the management and the long COVID gut problems um, in part two. So that brings me to the end of this part, uh, this first part of my talk on those gut problems in this In the second part, as I say, we'll go on to the treatment and management and outcomes. Um, As I mentioned at the start, any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I that I mention or have mentioned in this first part should only be considered after consider after discussion with your own GP. So in the meantime, I hope you found that helpful and I wish you well and Uh, I hopefully will see you in part two of my series and this gut problem in non-COVID session. Bye for now.